<laughs> Boy, I love this time of year. If I didn't have a church to talk about it in, I'd have to go out on the streets. I really do love it. I get to get involved in this extraordinary story of our Lord's processional into town, his teaching all week, his, his suffering on the cross, his resurrection. For me, it is just one of the most exciting things. We're going to do Good Friday a little bit differently. No, it's very different. We've never done Good Friday like this. First of all, we're not using the Gospel of Luke, which I have used for the last uh, 42 years. Uh, 43 must be a turning point. We're going to use the Gospel of John. It has a lot of rich, rich material in it. And I'm also going to have here a, a life-size copy. It's not the original. I talked to the Pope and he said I couldn't have it. It's a life-size copy of the Shroud. Uh, I'm not trying to convince you that the Shroud is authentic. Uh, you, can, you, can be a, you can be stupid and think it's not. That's up to you. I, no, I, you, you know, listen, in, anything that, that uh, a little bit of common sense tells us if you look at that thing, which cannot be reproduced today, that it is a witness to the resurrection, to the suffering and to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know there was a carbon-14 date back in 1988 that said it came from the Middle Ages, and then there was one from back in 84 that said it was authentic, and then there have been two or three other means of dating the cloth that said it was authentic. But I'm primarily just looking at the image on the cloth, which cannot be reproduced by any means today, uh, and with all that we can do with computers and artificial intelligence, there is no one in the whole world who can make anything that looks like the shroud. The only way to make anything that looks like the shroud is to crucify somebody, stick a, stick a sword in their side, they're dead and gone, and then get God to resurrect them. That is the only way to produce that enigmatic and beautiful and moving image. Anyway, we're going to be looking at it uh, this week. And... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that on Good Friday. It's going to be a different kind of service. I invite you to be here. If there are those listening at home who can make it to the church on Good Friday, we would like for you to do that. We'd like for you to be here on Holy Thursday, which celebrates communion, that first, first supper, first last supper, that time that our disciples gathered with our Lord. And on the very evening that he gathered, we will be gathering on the anniversary of that. And then on the anniversary of the first Good Friday, we will be here at that time when the sun goes down and the grave is quiet and we are waiting for the resurrection of our Lord. When I think about, uh, when I think about that week, that whole week, the words uh, come to my mind uh, <laughs> from, from the uh, musical My Fair Lady, where... Uh, uh, Eliza's father sings, get me to the church on time. But it's not the church that our Lord was trying to get to. Well, in a way, I guess it was. But uh, not a physical church. He was trying to get to the cross on time. He had to be on the cross on that Friday. And to get to the cross, he had to quite deliberately make people mad enough and scared enough to want him there. Now, there were already people who wanted him there, but it would take some provocation. You know, there are, there are scholars who say, uh, we got two kinds of scholars, conservative scholars and liberal scholars. The scholars that I read are usually liberal scholars because they're real scholars. Now you can, I guess, can be a conservative scholar, but if you're reading the Bible as though it is inerrant, you're already on the wrong track. For example, I was going to read, I haven't read it yet, have I? I was going to read that opening story from Matthew. I'll tell you after I read it, why I did not use Matthew. Here it is.
Well, it must not be in this Bible. Oh, oh, I'm in Zechariah. In Zechariah, it says, it says in Zechariah, this. Old Testament reading, for them it was just a Bible reading, it was just their scripture reading. There was no New Testament yet. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay. Now that, that is repetition, that is poetic repetition. Riding on a donkey, that's one animal, and it says the colt, the foal of a donkey, is still just one animal. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, if you want the Bible to be funny, uh, Matthew alone of the gospel writers misread that. He counted two animals. He said, oh, there is a donkey, and then there's the donkey's colt. That's both of them. And when he tells the story, he has two donkeys, a donkey and then a colt, okay? And he makes it clear that Jesus rides both of them. Can you picture this? Because Matthew was committed to the scripture. He said, well, if the scripture says it was two donkeys, it had to be two donkeys. But the other gospel writers knew better. They knew there was only one donkey. You can't ride two donkeys. So I wanted to read Matthew today, which is a wonderful account of this thing. But you keep coming up with those two donkeys that Jesus is riding on. And I decided we were going to let one donkey go. And we were going to read this from the gospel of Matthew. Uh, from, uh, from the Gospel of uh, Luke. So if you will give me a moment, uh, I don't seem to have, uh, to have marked it in Luke, foolishly, foolishly neglected to do so. But uh, it's, uh, it's coming if you'll just give me the chance to find it. Okay. Just a moment. This Bible has got too much in it. It really is. It's just got too much in it. Okay, just a moment. I could look up the number, but why do that when you can spend the whole hour looking for it? Uh, after Jesus had said these things, he sent on ahead, giving, uh, going up to Jerusalem, and as he approached uh, Bethphage and uh, Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter, you will find a, uh, a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden before. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what are you doing? Now, this was the password. Our Lord has set up the donkey. He's planned this whole thing out, and he's planned it deliberately. He took that Old Test that passage from the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, and he knew that this is something that everyone, everyone in the crowd, everyone in Jerusalem would associate with the coming of the Messiah because they always had. And he deliberately takes that Scripture and he plays out that image. Now, there are people who say, we're talking about liberal and conservative scholars. On the, on the liberal side, there are a lot of people who, they really like Jesus, and um, they think he's a nice guy, but they don't really believe in Jesus as Lord, okay? Now, these are some of the scholars that I read. They're good scholars. They just don't get quite to the point of belief which requires them to look at all of the evidence and to know God in a way that they actually don't tend to know God. They don't know how involved God is in the work of this world. They simply don't pay any attention to religious experiences. They just don't know how God works. 
So uh, they actually tend to say that Jesus never proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. They don't want him to do that because they don't believe he's the Messiah. They just believe he's a really, really nice guy. And so they say he never proclaimed. But the truth is our Lord proclaimed it in at least three ways. First of all, he proclaimed it every time he told someone, your sins are forgiven because only God had the power to forgive sin. And everyone knew this. This is why they were so astounded every time Jesus told someone, your sins are forgiven. A human being could not tell a human being your sins are forgiven. Only God and the coming Messiah would be able to tell people their sins are forgiven. The second thing is Jesus took authority over the scriptures. He was willing to say, I know this is what this says, but I'm going to tell you something different. And he did that from time to time. And when he, uh, when he was preaching, he usually didn't even make reference to the scriptures, although he honored and loved the scriptures. He would say things on his own, and that caused people to say, well, he speaks with his own authority. He's not referencing the scripture when he says this. Well, he could speak with his own authority because he was the source of all, okay? So those are the first two ways. The third way in which we know that he proclaimed himself to be uh, <laughs> to be Lord, to be Son of God, to be, uh, uh, to be King of the world, was what he's doing today with his entrance into Jerusalem, with his deliberately taking that colt and riding on it into town. And we know what happens. Uh, first of all, I think probably the disciples were the ones who were throwing things in front of our Lord. This is what you call seeding the crowd. Billy Graham used to do it. He did. You remember the Billy Graham Crusades? Okay, do you? It means you're pretty old. Well, anyway, the Billy Graham Crusades, and I, 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 used, to, I used to be touched, touched by them, and I was particularly touched when he concluded that sermon, and he invited people to give their lives to Jesus Christ, and immediately hundreds of people would start pouring out of the stadium and coming down to the front. Now, those first people were his workers, okay? They were all of the people involved in the crusade. But when you saw them coming down, it did touch your heart. And if you were inclined to go down that day, that would help you do it. I suspect that our Lord, and he's doing something deliberately here, doing it very deliberately. He knows what the outcome is going to be. He's going to cause a big ruckus. He has the disciples, but then they, the people see him riding in on a donkey. The disciples shouting, Hosanna. They join in. They shout, Hosanna. It gets bigger and it gets bigger. They started ripping their clothes off and throwing them in front of our Lord as he rides over them on that donkey and he's entering into Jerusalem. And not only is he role playing, he is also the real thing. And there comes a point where the authorities Tell him, shut your people up. Close this down right now. He said, listen, if I tried to stop them, the very stones of the earth would shout out. And he rode on toward Jerusalem. And when he saw the city, it says he paused to weep over it. And the next thing he does is perhaps the most outlandish thing that our Lord ever did on this earth. And he knows the results of it. He knows what's going to happen. He's already got people angry. He's got them upset. He's got them afraid. And the next thing that he does is really going to strike at the heart of society at that time. The religious society at that time. The powers that be. He enters into the temple John makes it clear he has a whip. He doesn't hit anybody with the whip, but he does drive out all of the animals that had been brought there for the sacrifice. He drives them all out. And then he goes over. Now imagine this. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine the effect of this? Here in the temple just before Passover with thousands of pilgrims in town, and he's there at the heart of the whole thing, the temple, where people believe that God resides in the heart of that temple, the Holy of Holies. And here this come, man comes in, 
acting like he owns the place. Why does he act like that? Because he knows he owns the place. And he turns over the tables of the money changers where people, poor people, would come with their little turtle dove for an offering without blemish, and the guys would say, oh, I find a little blemish here, but we've got another turtle dove right over here that's just perfect for just a few more pennies. It was a money-making operation. And all of the money went to the priestly family, to uh, Caiaphas the high priest, to his father-in-law, Annas. Now, when Jesus is arrested later in the week, where do they take him? Do they take him directly to the Sanhedrin, to their court? No, they take him to the father-in-law's house, Annas the high priest, the guy who knows where the power lies because he has it, and his son-in-law, Caiaphas. The religious authorities, don't ever let anybody tell you that the Jews killed Jesus. The only reason they did not kill Jesus right then with their bare hands is because of the people. They were afraid of the people. It tells us that. And they, they, they looked all week for a way to discredit him, to disqualify him. They asked him, but what authority do you do these kinds of things? Like cleansing out the temple, like riding in on that donkey. Who gave you this authority? And all that week, they listened to him. He stood in a place at the temple called Solomon's Court, and he preached there every day. He was in complete control of everything. Now at night, the people were not there. So what did Jesus do? He hid out. Before the crowds dispersed, he would make his way through the crowds and he would go to a place on the Mount of Olives. Some rich guy owned a plot of land there. There are some wealthy people involved in this story. Joseph of Arimathea, who had that 14-foot piece of cloth that our Lord was wrapped in, was one of the guys had some money, and he had some power, and he had some influence. We know because he was able to go to Pilate and beg the body of Jesus so that Jesus was not thrown into a common grave. We know he had that pull. So there are some people with money involved in this business. All of our Lord's followers were not, were not poor. And some of his followers, a lot of his followers were former tax collectors or may have still been tax collectors. And they were notorious for being rich. And before they got, Jesus got hold of them, unscrupulous. So they could not arrest him during the day. And at night he was hiding out and he would appear again at Solomon's portico in the morning and teach the people and argue with them and and talk to them and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's love. And then at night, he and the disciples would sneak off to that particular hiding place until Thursday. Until Thursday. Until Thursday night, when he was determined to have that supper with his disciples. Well, how's he going to manage that? They're not going to have a very good supper out there among those trees on the side of the Mount of Olives. It's all arranged. There's a place that's been prepared, an upper room. He told a couple of his disciples, I've got a password for you. You're going to go into town, into the marketplace, and you're going to see a man there carrying a pitcher of water. Okay? Now, there must have been a lot of men in the marketplace carrying water. No, there was only one. Only women carried water. You say, you're going to see a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him to the place where he leads you. And when you get there, say to the good man of the house, where is that upper room where 
our Lord may eat that meal with his disciples. That's the password. And he will show you an upper room furnished and waiting and everything is ready. This whole week was an operation with our Lord on the ground and some friends beyond and above all, the God of all of this universe making sure that everything worked as planned because the timing had to be so perfect that our blessed Lord was buried at just the setting of the sun so that the disciples would have time to get him in the tomb and get him sealed up and then get back to their houses before sundown and the Sabbath started. And they would not have time to wash the body, which was always done with a burial. And if they had washed the body, that image that is on the cloth, which I believe is a deliberate witness to the crucifixion and the resurrection, would not exist as it does today. It would not tell the same story. Everything had to work as planned, not just as our Lord planned, but as his Father also planned. Now let me read you something from uh, a respected theologian and a very prominent one. He passed away, I think, in 2015, Uh, Marcus Borg. He was a good guy, devoted to Jesus, loved him, thought Jesus was a very nice person. But that's about as far as he went. According to Marcus Borg, the death of Jesus on the cross was not God's idea. It is never the will of God, says Borg, that a righteous man should be crucified. Did it have to happen in the way it did? It might have turned out differently, he says. Judas Judas might not have betrayed Jesus. The temple authorities might have decided on a course of action other than crucifixion. Pilate might have let Jesus go and decided on a punishment less than death. But it did happen the way it did. And early Christians looked back on this event as it happened and described providential meaning to Jesus' death. Now, I hate to talk about anybody in a negative way from the pulpit, but the boy did not know how God works. I'm telling you the very opposite. That whole week, history was managed. In that prayer, our Lord says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In that week, God's will was done on earth in Jerusalem as it is in heaven. And on that Easter Sunday morning, we see the result. We go from the most abject misery and suffering and fear and pain to the most extraordinary exultation and sense of victory. 
And this is what we need to know. There is in all of this universe no power against God's grace. And that includes in your life and in mine. And this week with our blessed Lord, we follow him in his footsteps as he chooses to go to that supper, to that cross, to that grave, and on to our victory. Now, usually at the end of the service, things turn a little bit darker, getting ready for Holy Thursday and Good Friday. But the choir has chosen an anthem which is so glorious that we ain't getting dark today. And Palm Sunday is a day of celebration. Palm Sunday was the day in which they were feeling the victory in which our Lord was taking charge of this world which belongs to him and operating as though it was his. Our choir is going to sing an old piece by Mr. Franz Joseph Handel. And it's going to say, the heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. And as, we, as they sing this, I want you to think about what God did in that last week and through Easter for you and for me. And Jesus made it clear, I break this bread for you. This this is my body. This is my blood. I'm doing this for you. I want us to see that God has pulled this glory for you and for me. The heavens are telling of the work of his hands. You won't get all of the words because our organ is going at full power. But just keep in mind, this is a celebration of that victory of Palm Sunday, that victory which is the cross, where the expression of God's love reached its pinnacle. And then that Easter Sunday with that burst of glory and hallelujah.